following program was a production of the Fairfax Network, Fairfax County Public Schools, funded in part by the Virginia Satellite Educational Network. This program was made possible through generous support from the Donald W. Reynolds Foundation to George Washington's Mount Vernon Estate and Garden. History Notes, The Music of Washington's World is a co-production of the Fairfax Network and George Washington's Mount Vernon Estate and Gardens. And welcome to History Notes, the music of Washington's world. I'm Acadia. I'm Allie. And I'm Kia. In this program, we're going to explore history through music. For thousands of years, music has provided history soundtrack by reflecting the times and cultures in which it is created. So we're going to delve into music from George Washington's world to see how his life was shaped by music and what role music played in the 18th century. Throughout the show, We'll speak with leading experts, hear music from the 18th century, and follow the timeline of Washington's life. The theory is simple. Music reveals history. So how do we know what music was popular during colonial times? Well, I had a chance to have a conversation with David Hildebrand. He's one of the top experts on the music of the colonial period. Not only does David travel across the country performing 18th century music, but he teaches students about the importance of studying history. How did you get interested in music from this period? That's actually a question I get asked a lot. It goes back many years when someone asked me, do you know any colonial music? And I thought, colonial music? Oh my gosh, what's that? And it got me curious. Why is it important for us to learn about this kind of music? Well, actually, there are two, two reasons. One is that it teaches you about history. And, and you have to know your history. You have to learn from history. And the other thing is it also teaches you about yourself. I mean, there's certain things in human nature that just don't change over time. Well, that's cool. I really thought of it that way. Well, how do we know what songs were popular in the 18th century? Well, since there was no recording back then, you're pretty stuck with things that are written down or printed. And so you look in places like colonial newspapers, look in people's letters, and their journals or diaries that they might write. So to research the popular songs of the time, you need to look at documents from that time period, also called primary sources. Unlike today, there was no way to record music 200 years ago. George Washington didn't own an iPod, any CDs, or even any records. The lyrics of a song would be published in newspapers or broadsides. A broadside is a large sheet of paper printed on one side, then posted in public places and distributed by hand so that everyone had the chance to learn the latest news, or in this case, the latest songs. In fact, colonists used newspapers and broadsides to support their position for or against the Revolutionary War. So the published lyrics of songs were used as a political tool, and often these songs were protest songs that called for liberty and independence from the British monarchy. While well, I relate my story, Americans give ear. A Britain's fading glory, you presently shall hear. I'll give a true relation, a turn to what I say, concerning that taxation of North America. Of course, music played a role during the years leading up to our War of American Independence as well. Uh, it was the song that could be widely understood. It was the song that could travel from one colony to the next and ultimately one state to the next. And they told the story, the songs of uh, liberty and the songs of taxation. Uh, they were protest songs. They were songs calling for action against the king, against his ministers. But music and songs were a significant, uh, significant factor in communicating the story that led up to our war of American independence. Come join hand in hand, brave Americans all, and rouse your bold hearts at the liberty's call. 
In 1768, the earliest of these protest songs, The Liberty Song, was written by John Dickinson, a lawyer and gentleman farmer from Philadelphia. Dickinson was angry about the Townsend Acts, which were a series of taxes imposed on the colonies by England. However, the colonists thought that the taxes were unfair, especially since they had no representation in Parliament. In the 18th century, the same tunes were used over and over but with different lyrics. This was called a musical parody. So, as the words were circulated, the average colonist would immediately know the tune and how to sing the politically charged words. And so the first part of the, of the change, or the transition, of English music to American music would be where we take an English tune and someone in America writes new words to it. And that happened all the time, especially during the period leading up to the revolution and thereafter. It's called parody, when you, um, you paradise, you take an old tune and you write the new words. Though writing a parody of another song was the most common form of musical expression, a few early Americans began to compose new music as well. Chester, written by William Billings, became an anthem of the Revolutionary War. Billings primarily wrote music for the New England churches. Chester was originally written as a hymn, but rewritten to show his support and belief in the patriot cause. And the, the song Chester is, is a great example of that, where he is in a position of already having published some music books and having started a bit of a music business for church music, all of a sudden the goal of that business is more toward revolution and freedom than it is toward religion and worship. The words of these revolutionary protest songs show how patriotism swept the 13 colonies, and it wasn't long before the colonists took action. In April 1775, the first battle of the Revolutionary War took place at Lexington and Concord in Massachusetts. After what is known as the shot heard around the world, which was fired by the Patriots, the Continental Congress knew that the war was inevitable. Unanimously, they appointed George Washington as the Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army on June 15, 1775. Washington's presence and character quickly won over the colonists. In 1776, Jonathan Mitchell Sewall wrote lyrics about the brave General Washington and his struggles to fight the British. And well, as an added insult to the British, he set the lyrics to the tune of British Grenadiers, a very well-known and important tune in England. Vain Britons boast no longer with proud indignity. By land you're conquering legions, your matchless strength by sea. Since we, your sons, incensed, our swords have girded on. Huzzah, 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 huzzah for war in Washington. Uh, there's a melody that everybody knew as a march and associated it with the British Army. Um, in that case, the melody takes on a little more importance because it, the melody is symbolic of something else, the same way that our national anthem is symbolic for us today. If someone were to take our national anthem and, and write insulting words against America, we would, we would be especially upset at that tune. But that's what we did to the British in 1776. And it was one of the most popular songs of the whole war. It was known as War and Washington, or General Washington. As the lyrics of War and Washington circulated, General George Washington was seen as a hero across the colonies. A song written about me, well, it, it engenders a variety of feelings. There is a side of me that thinks it's all silliness. But there is another side in which I am greatly flattered. And the lyrics spread like lightning through the broadsides. Colonists and soldiers alike were proud of their general and equally committed to the cause of American independence. Fires us all, strengthens each brave son, from him who humbly guides the plow to God like Washington. As are all good officers, 
I am a motivator. I am there to lift up the soldiery with my words, to raise their spirits, and to lead by example. And if a song conveys those things, then it is a good thing for the army. An equally popular song of the Revolutionary War was Yankee Doodle. It's just as popular today, though the words most students learn in school are actually quite a bit insulting to the early colonists. I visited Washington Mill Elementary School to find out what a class of third grade students think of Yankee Doodle, and to teach them a thing or two. Hi everybody, does anybody know the patriotic song Yankee Doodle? Okay, you two, let's hear it. Yankee Doodle went to town a-riding on a pony, stuck a feather in his hat and called it macaroni. Wait, wait, is that the only version you two know? That's actually from way after Washington's time. You see, Yankee Doodle was a bit of a teasing song that the British used to make fun of the colonists with. And the colonists took the song, changed the words, and made fun of the British right back. In fact, there are over a hundred versions of Yankee Doodle. Can you teach us another version that Washington knew? And now, let's sing another parody. There was Captain Washington upon a slapping stallion, giving orders to his men, I guess there was a million. Yankee Doodle, keep it up, Yankee Doodle dandy. Mind the music and the step and with the girls be candy. Now we've got some educated Yankees in this class. Not only were songs written in support of the Patriots' cause, but music also played an important role on the battlefields of the Revolutionary War. Musicians are the primary manner with which we communicate. Frequently there is uh, the, the fog of war, as it is called. Frequently there is smoke, there's a discharge of muskets and various guns and cannons. I would convey orders to my aides, they would convey the orders to uh, brigade and division commanders, and uh, they in turn would convey them to the musicians. The role of music during the American Revolution uh, is something that you wouldn't guess today. It was actually communication. Uh, of course, there weren't cell phones, there weren't walkie-talkies, there weren't satellite radios. So you had to spread the word from the commander across the battlefield to however many troops you had. Uh, and the way that was accomplished was through loud music. Today, the United States Army Old Guard Fife and Drum Corps carry on the musical traditions of our nation. The Old Guard is known for historical accuracy in recreating the music and uniforms of the Continental Army. Well, our uniforms are patterned after the Revolutionary War musicians' uniform. And uh, musicians of the time wore reverse colors of their parent infantry unit. And our parent infantry unit wears blue coats with red facings, and that's why we wear the red coats with blue facing, so in the smoke and confusion of battle, the commander could find a musician rather quickly. All of the instruments that we play are adaptations of historical instruments. Um, a fife in the 18th century would have had six holes. This one actually has 10. The fifes of the 18th century 
Um, some of the notes would have been more sharp than others, some of the notes would have been more flat than others, and that would sound awful odd to an, a modern ear. Soldiers would be taught to recognize a melody or a drum beating um, and react to it, um, to do what that melody instructed them to do. If the, the commander needed to, to stop his regiment from firing, uh, his voice certainly wasn't going to be heard over the firing, so he turns to his fifer and drummer, who are always, hopefully, positioned right near him, uh, issues the command cease fire, and they play the tune. It gets picked up down the line by every other fifer and drummer on the field, and the soldiers closest to that fifer and drummer would hear the tune, know what to do, and cease firing. Music played a, a hugely important role in regulating their daily activities, whether they were in the camp or on the march or in the battlefield, uh, music was the form of communication. It was the patterns of the drum beats that, that set the tempo of the march. It was the patterns of the drum beats that communicated specific signals uh, during camp uh, for, uh, there would be a sing signal, for instance, for, for gathering firewood. There'd be a signal for waking up in the morning, reveille. We think of that as a bugle call today, but it was a drum call during the revolution. And so the, the, the signals that the drums communicated were hugely important. As you can see, music was an important tool during the Revolutionary War. And as we all know from history class, the British surrendered to the Americans at the Battle of Yorktown in 1781 though the war didn't actually end until two years later when the Treaty of Paris was signed. The British eventually evacuated New York City on November 25, 1783. When George Washington triumphantly rode into the city, there was a lot of celebrating. Shortly after, Washington resigned his commission as Commander-in-Chief and returned to Mount Vernon. I'm standing in the central passage at Mount Vernon. From here, family and visitors could access many of the downstairs rooms, especially the music room. It was expected that children would learn to dance and play an instrument. These lessons were important instruction for their social rank. I did purchase a harpsichord for my granddaughter, Nellie. And I did so because it is appropriate that a young lady in Virginia society can play an instrument. It raises her standing, it, it teaches her, and it conveys that she is a cultured young lady. We have a record of Washington purchasing uh, some of the very finest instruments uh, for family members, whether it was Martha Washington's children from her first marriage or her grandchildren uh, from uh, her son and daughter-in-law. The harpsichord, uh, as well, is really a top-of-the-line instrument. Um, it actually is a dual manual keyboard and has several other sorts of stops and pedals that, uh, when she was taught to use them properly, uh, could uh, be used with great effect. Uh, you know, they could cause you know, swells or crescendos or to dampen the sound, to soften the sound. Well, the harpsichord in the home was two things. First of all, it was an object of beauty. It was a piece of furniture. Uh, they were beautifully adorned, uh, very nice to look at, but more importantly, to be opened up and tuned and played. And it would be used to entertain uh, family and friends visiting. It would have been used just for the betterment of the children. Children uh, were generally, and the wealthier families were taught to dance and to play upon a certain instrument. During this time, a full-bound music book was quite expensive. It was more common for people to order individual sheets of music, which they could later bind together into a book of music. There's one particular music book that we find very interesting because it has Martha Washington's name written right at the very top of it, but in George Washington's handwriting. And it's a book called The Bullfinch. It's a collection of songs from Scotland and, and England and Ireland. So early in their marriage, um, 
Martha Washington would also have been uh, receiving gifts of music uh, from George Washington. And she, I think Martha's role in uh, uh, musical education of her children and then her grandchildren is extremely important. Um, she seems to have encouraged uh, her children and I think her grandchildren uh, to be uh, accomplished well, with an instrument. In fact, it has been said that Martha Washington had her granddaughter Nellie practice the harpsichord for hours, where according to her brother, she would play and cry, cry and play. Nellie acquired quite a collection of music, including a work called Waterpiece. Though she only played the harpsichord part of Waterpiece, or Water Music, by George Friedrich Handel, it was written as a collection of orchestral movements, as performed here by the Virginia Chamber Orchestra. Music was a very important part of Washington's life, despite the fact that by his own admission, um, he could neither sing nor play any instrument. I think music surrounded Washington, and he seeks out opportunities uh, to hear music, uh, whether it is in the home or at the theater. Um, or going to other public performances. But certainly here at Mount Vernon, I think music would have been a part of their daily uh, life. You would have heard music in the mansion, but you would have also heard music on the outlying farms. Songs and stories were a vital part of the daily lives of the slave community at Mount Vernon. By 1799, there were over 300 enslaved African Americans who lived and worked on the estate which was over 8,000 acres. I had a chance to speak with Larry Earle, a prominent historian and musician. Sit down, sit down and take your rest. Well, you got to lay your head upon my Savior's breast. I love the Lord. I love the Lord. Oh, my Savior and my God. Go ahead, y'all. Sit down. I sit down. Whoa, sit down. I sit down, mother, sit down. Sit down and take your rest. Well, now you got to lay your head upon my Savior's breast. I love the Lord. How important was the music in the lives of slaves who lived and worked at Mount Vernon? Oh, it was extremely important, not only for the enslaved community here at Mount Vernon, but also for the enslaved population throughout North and South America. Music is something that they would use to survive in slavery. Music would be used to take their minds off the, the, the work of the day, but it also allows them a way to express themselves. So the music takes on religious purpose, takes on satirical purposes. It's really important for their daily existence and survival. Ho, Emma, ho, you turn around, dig a hole in the ground. Ho, Emma, ho, well now, Emma, you've got rotten teeth. Ho, Emma, ho, you turn around, dig a hole in the ground. Ho, Emma, ho, well now, Emma, they must be wooden teeth. Ho, Emma, ho, <laughs> Can you tell us about Ho Emma Ho? Sure, Ho Emma Ho is a great song. It's a classic call work song, where you can imagine the enslaved community out in the field doing their work um, to till up the soil. They all have hoes and they're trying to get the work done. Well, in the call and response fashion, Ho Emma Ho, there's the caller who knows the verse, and there's the responders who call to help keep the pace of the work. And that's the call and response. And that would help set the pace of the work, would make sure that the work gets done, and in the enslaved community, if all the work's done, the mass is happy, no one will be sold, we'll get our rations on time, we won't work ourselves to death, because we're only working as fast as Ho Emma Ho will allow us to, and we keep that song nice and slow.
I've heard slaves use songs in codes to either make fun or give directions for escape. Is this true? Oh, very much so. Uh, there's a song that I love called Lost John. And you have to help me out with this one because okay. it's great. Because if you didn't know the story of Lost John, if you repeated the song and listened closely, you could hear how Lost John escaped. So sort of repeat after me. It goes, one day, one day. One day, one day. I was walking along. I was walking along. And I heard a little voice. And I heard a little voice. Like a turkey through the corn. Like a turkey through the corn. Oh, it was old lost John. It was old lost John. With his long clothes on. With his long clothes on. Well, see, that tells a story. Because we first know, how did lost John make his escape? He went through the corn. Nobody can find him in the cornfield. But listen to this part. He had a heel in front. He had a heel in front. And a heel behind. And a heel behind. I said you couldn't hardly tell. I said you couldn't hardly tell which way he was going which way he was going now that's pretty funny because the story says that lost John he got two pairs of shoes his old pair of shoe and his new pair of shoes that he got annually he took the, took the heels off his old shoe and put them on the front of his new shoes so when he walked he had a heel in front and a heel behind and you couldn't hardly tell which way he was going <laughs> perfect great for telling how lost John made his escape from slavery Has this early music influenced music today? Very much so. We look at uh, the African American contribution to the American experience. Music is one way that's easily identifiable to see how they contributed. In our modern music today, whether it's rock and roll, jazz, country, hip hop, you'll find that African influence there. The way of taking polyrhythms, or what that means is taking lots of different beats that have different sounds and put them together, sort of in a way that they blend and make a unique form, uniquely African. You might have all these different sounds for it, a bell, a drum, some sort of shaking instrument. By themselves, they don't sound very good, but when you put them together and they overlap, they make one fantastic sound. That's the basis of our modern musical forms that we listen to. That Africanness of that form is what we find, which links the present to the past. Why is it important to remember these songs? It's important to remember these songs because they provide for us a model. A model on how we can overcome and survive anything if we just use music and our cultural heritage to take us through. The story of how those Africans survive is a great story and it's an American story that we told through our music. Washington was not only an active farmer, but as a member of the gentry, or proper society, he served as a vestryman at the nearby Pohick Church. Kia visited the site to see history up close and take in a unique performance. Thanks, Acadia. It's so cool that Pohick Church looks a lot like it did 200 years ago when George Washington attended services here. Not only was Washington a member of the church, he actually used his skill as a surveyor to help figure out where the church would be built. Like many wealthy men of the time, he even purchased a pew to help pay for the building. In fact, I'm standing in front of the Washington family's pew. Shout to Jehovah all the earth. Shout in the Jehovah churches Washington visited, he would have heard psalms. And psalm, it's a word you have to say kind of carefully. It sounds a lot like song, but psalm, P-S-A-L-M, means it's a, a musical setting of one of the, of the books of psalms from the Bible. Jehovah, he is God. In many cases, people didn't know the melodies. They grew up in the New World. They hadn't been taught the melodies. And so they would line them out. And what lining out involves is one person singing a line, and then everyone else would repeat it back. However, starting in the northern colonies, special attention was given to religious musical education. So the singing schools were developed. Uh, a singing master was uh, hired to, to teach uh, some of the basic songs, the rudiments of music, and he would charge a tuition and uh, uh, the ministers and 
or the clerks of, of the, the church would advertise his services and uh, he would uh, teach songs to whoever would, would come and, and uh, want to learn. Singing this popular 18th century fuguing tune called Northfield, students from West Potomac High School make up a modern day singing school. They sing the multiple choral parts and imitative sections that define a fuguing tune. As members of the Colonial Singers, they study history and music. What's the most interesting thing you've learned about being in this choir? Definitely the history aspect. Um, we'll be working in class and Mr. Johnson will come out and be like, I just learned something on the internet and he'll share like a fun fact with us and you just learn new stuff like as you go on. Through all of the songs that you guys study, is there a particular song that really just sticks out for you? That's a hard question because so many of the songs, there's so much of a story behind each song and so much to think about, so much to put through. You can get so incredibly involved with each song that it's, it's hard to choose a favorite because they all come to mean a lot to you. They come part of your life. One of the reasons I started the Colonial Singers was to reach out to the elementary students who are learning the, the uh, revolutionary period. And this music um, and our clothing and our whole presentation plugs into that which they are studying about during the Revolutionary War period. Um, and we hope to uh, give an aspect of this period of time that goes above and beyond the textbook that might share the music, the dance, and even the life. Each one of these singers has a character that they sh share a little bit about a, a colonial teenager in the presentation. I'm standing in the large dining room at Mount Vernon. It was the last room added to the house, and it is the grandest. Two stories high and big enough to fit the average size home in the 18th century. We believe that it was here, in this very room, that George Washington learned he had been unanimously elected the first president of the United States. And of course, many songs were written to honor this occasion. Philip File wrote the President's March to celebrate the first presidential inauguration. Later, words were added by Joseph Hopkinson, who titled it, Hail Columbia. This song quickly became a favorite contender for the new country's national anthem. You know, I have a recollection of the journey that I took from Mount Vernon up to New York City when I took the oath of office in April of 1789. From Alexandria City onward, all the way up to New York, I was met with adulation, with crowds, and with music of all sort and all manner. Uh, instruments and singing and praises were given and thanks were given and Again, I find no greater reward than the approbation of my fellow citizens. On April 30th, 1789, George Washington was sworn into office and became our first president. As you can imagine, his life changed dramatically when he took on that responsibility, a job no one in the world had ever done before. But music was still an important part of his life. Maybe it helped him relax. I greatly enjoyed both concerts and attending the theater. Uh, concerts, of course, I have attended primarily in Philadelphia City, but elsewhere, uh, to be sure. Uh, orchestral pieces, concertos, solos, ensembles, vocal pieces. Uh, I greatly enjoy concerts. And again, as I said earlier, I am amazed at people that can play an instrument. The events held at the theater 
weren't at all all dramatic. You could have concerts. We know that Washington did attend several concerts. We don't know a lot of the specific programs to connect to the ones that they went to, though, except for uh, a symphony by Haydn, his number 85, La Reine, or the Queen, uh, is a symphony that we know that he saw. The, the musical activities in America were so different from those in Europe, and especially when it came to concerts and, and opera, which is the, big form, the most formal kind of theatrical presentation. In America, we just didn't have the resources to, to create the kinds of opera that was very popular in the cities of London and Paris and so forth. I laid on Greenland's coast And in my arms embraced my lass Warm amidst eternal frost To soon the half year's night would pass And I would love thee every day Every night we'd kiss and play If with me you'd fondly stray Over the hills and far away The kind of theater or, or ballad opera it's a very different kind of opera that George Washington and others heard, uh, was much more simple. It was sung in English, and it was based on familiar melodies, on folk tunes. And so you know, the music can have a very different sort of a role in these ballad operas, but it's not the formal composed music of George Frederick Handel and the great Italian composers. It's more, much more folk music. I would love thee every day. Every night we'd kiss and play If with me you'd fondly stray Over the hills and far away Just like today, music was a very popular form of entertainment from operas and concerts to songs sung at home. Because of its size, the Central Passage was a space to entertain guests. Frequently, Dances would be held in a home or at a local tavern so people could dance and socialize, but also discuss politics and business. We know from his writings, as well as those of his friends and family, that George Washington loved to dance. In fact, he was a great dancer. And when George Washington walked into a ballroom, he was greeted like a celebrity. The minuet was, traditionally, the first dance performed at a ball. It was danced by the highest ranking couple in attendance. The number of minuets is limited, specifically, by legislation here in Virginia. There was a time at which there were too many people wanting to step a minuet. So the Virginia legislature in the 1770s deemed it appropriate to have only three to open any ball. Now I want to tell you something. Uh, a ball was not simply about the dance, although it was a very, very significant portion of it. It was a way that people socialized. It was a way, indeed, that people would convey their requests for favors done. And I will tell you that, in some cases, business deals were actually concluded at balls as well. But by and large, it was about the dance and about socializing. After the minuet was performed, a variety of country dances allowed everyone to dance and take part in the festivities. The ballroom here at Gadsby's Tavern was constructed specifically for dancing and also for music. The fact that it is a large room that has a hanging musicians gallery allowed at least 90 people to take part in the dancing displays. Everyone learned how to dance, especially here in Virginia. 
If you were a Virginian gentleman and it were expected to be a Virginia gentleman, then you had to know how to dance. Dancing was taught to all ages as soon as they could walk, they were taught how to dance. But by the time a young lady was in her teens or a young gentleman in his teens, they were expected to know how to at least execute the figures so that when they were invited to social affairs, they would know how to, to participate in the dancing. To honor George Washington, the great general and first president, the British tradition of celebrating the monarch's birthday was adapted in America to celebrate Washington's birthday with a birth night ball. George Washington was loved by everyone and they really wanted to celebrate George Washington by honoring him at his birthday. So the first public celebration of his birthday or birth night is what they called it, a birth night celebration, was actually held at Valley Forge in 1778. When they constructed Gadsby's Tavern with its large ballroom, this was the perfect place to hold that kind of celebration here in Alexandria. And John Gadsby, who was the tavern keeper at that time, invited George Washington to attend his birth night celebration in 1798. He attended, he also attended in 1799. Dance is very important to Washington, so he must have had some sort of an ear for music that he could at least keep up <laughs> with a beat, um, which I think is really important, that he must have had some ear for it. Uh, because uh, time and again, uh, people comment on his dancing ability and how much he enjoys dancing and that he can dance for hours at a time. Though we don't know how George Washington learned to dance, some people think his fencing master may have taught him, we do know that he obtained the highest compliment. French officers noted that his dancing could not have been improved by a Parisian education. Actually, I learned from David Hildebrand that compliments for George Washington came in many forms. So did people write lots of songs about George Washington? Oh my goodness, yes, they certainly did. Lots of kinds of music, too. They wrote minuets, the dance tunes for him. They wrote marches. Uh, of course, when he died, they, they wrote uh, dirges, which is appropriate music for a funeral. But more importantly, they wrote songs that praised him and that encouraged other people to be very confident in their leader. They toasted each other a lot, and they called each other heroes. And, and for, for instance, there's a song called, He Comes, the Hero Comes. He comes, this mighty Washington, words fail to tell all he has done. Our hero, guard, and father, friend, his fame can never, never end. Hero, guard, you father, friend, his fame can never, never end. And it's new words written to an old English tune again. And it was sung on numerous occasions, especially when he was on his grand tours and he would enter a city. They would go, he comes, the hero comes, and they'd sing it for him and everyone would get all excited. And so, you know, music really can play that role. It sounds like he was a real celebrity. He was. People loved him. And, and even more so, after he died, the, the stories of his fame got bigger and bigger and until he's clearly the best known and most important American. Thanks so much for sharing all this cool information. I learned a lot. Cool. I'm happy to share it. It's really kind of fun. Oh, it was great to meet you. Nice to see you. Joy to Washington. Well, I've certainly learned a lot about how music shaped George Washington's life, and in reverse, how his life shaped music. Music certainly has the power to unite us as a nation, pull us together into action, and shape our culture. And music still has that power today. Music reveals history, but also reveals who we are and our way of life. I wonder what historians of the future will think of us when they listen to and study the music of our life. Thanks for joining us as we explored music of the 18th century and the father of our country, George Washington. If you want more information about this topic or to request a DVD, 
please visit fcps.edu slash Fairfax Network or visit mountvernon.org for more information on George Washington and the Mount Vernon Estate and Gardens. Thanks for joining us on History Notes, the music of Washington's world.